Okay, Professor Leone, could you check it or not? Does it work? Perfect. So I think we can get started. Um, first of all, I'd like to give you a brief introduction about the conference. This is uh, the sixth conference of management and economics researchers in Azerbaijan. And uh, for this specific year, we are devoting this conference to green economy, to sustainable development. And I'm really grateful to you all for accepting my invitation to join this workshop. I believe that your experiences, your research experience, and your personal experience in a specific relevant field would be very valuable. So uh, this workshop specifically focuses on uh, entrepreneurship, innovation, and AI for sustainable development. And Anmar is going to focus on how we can actually leverage entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurship for contributing to sustainable development, while Professor Leone is going to talk about um, opportunity recognition for sustainable development, and uh, Professor Gerda will talk about AI and sustainable development. So, um, I'm going to give the floor to Anmar Kamaladin, uh, and he's joining us from Chalmers University of Technology. So, Anmar, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Mahmoud. Uh, first of all, am I muted? No, I'm not. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mahmoud, uh, for inviting me. It's uh, a pleasure uh, to be here at this uh, workshop, uh, and uh, I look forward uh, to uh, meaningful discussions. Um, maybe I, I, I think uh, I will share my uh, screen, if that's okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Okay, this. I think you now you should be able to see my screen, right? It is loading. Yes, now we can see that. Okay, okay. Um, so uh, let me uh, start by uh, introducing myself. Uh, I am uh, Anmar Kamal al uh, a postdoctoral uh, researcher at the Division of Entrepreneurship and Strategy at the Chalmers uh, University uh, of Technology. Uh, it's located in Gothenburg uh, in Sweden. Uh, my research focuses on uh, sustainable entrepreneurship and innovation, uh, and particularly on how uh, universities' uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems can support and enable uh, sustainable uh, development. Um, so often when I discuss my research on sustainability or when I tell people that I'm researching a sustainability related topic, I hear statements uh, like these, uh, climate change is already a reality. The earth is already collapsing, why bother? Um, isn't it too late to do anything about uh, sustainability? Many, many people express uh, a sense of um, defeatism, if I may call it, uh, believing that it's uh, too late to make uh, a difference. Uh, they ask uh, why waste time and energy on something unsolvable? Um, and, and this is why I wanted uh, to title my presentation from challenge to opportunity, leveraging entrepreneurship for sustainable uh, development. Uh, I hope to bring some optimism uh, to a topic of, uh, often uh, viewed with uh, pessim pessimism. Um, I believe that with every challenge comes an, op an opportunity. Uh, and that's what uh, entrepreneurship is all about. Uh, it's about uh, basically solving uh, problems. It's about finding opportunities uh, in spite of the challenges. Uh, but in order to actually contribute to solving problems, we need to have a sense of optimism that we can actually make uh, a difference. Uh, I want to start uh, with uh, this powerful quote of uh, Paul Hawken. When asked if I am pessimistic or optimistic about the future, my answer is always the same. If you look at the science about what is happening on Earth, and aren't pessimistic, you don't understand the data. But if you meet the people who are working to restore this earth and the lives of the poor, and you aren't optimistic, you haven't got a pulse. 
I, I really like this quote because I think it brings uh, a great deal uh, of hope. And uh, and uh, basically, like Hawken is is an entrepreneur himself and an economist, but also an environmentalist, uh, an environmental activist. Uh, he is also an author and has published a number of books. And actually, when I started digging into the into sustainability before even doing my master's or PhD, I read his book, uh, The Ecology of Commerce, and I can strongly recommend it. Not that I am promoting it or anything, but I find this uh, book particularly uh, interesting and easy to read as well, easy to follow, and I think it's very insightful. So it's very good read. Um, so if I may, uh, I would recommend uh, reading it. Uh, but moving on, like uh, a very simple uh, question, like uh, what is entrepreneurship? L let me ask by asking you this question. And um, uh, I know that uh, it's not an interactive session per se, but uh, I would like you to take a moment to just Google that. What is entrepreneurship? Uh, just take uh, 30 seconds to Google that. What does entrepreneurship mean? Okay, so just to show some examples of my Google search, what is entrepreneurship? Uh, you get uh, uh, to see a definition that is very business focused, the activity of setting up a business or businesses, taking on financial risk in the hope of profits. Um, entrepreneurship is very commonly defined uh, as starting a new business or creating a new venture. Um, even if you go to Wikipedia, you see that entrepreneurship is uh, the creation or extraction of economic value. You see that the economic value is emphasized in ways that uh, uh, generally entail beyond the minimal amount of risk uh, and potentially involving values besides simply economic ones. So I'm happy that it's actually acknowledging that uh, there is uh, there are additional values beyond the economic uh, and uh, financial uh, value. Uh, so yeah, I would like to emphasize that entrepreneurship, the, the, the concept of entrepreneurship, uh, we at Chalmers, uh, uh, we like to view it uh, as broader than just starting uh, a business. We believe that it is much more than that. It's about solving problems. It's about bringing about change. It's about creating value. Yes, it does include economic financial value for the entrepreneur, and there is nothing wrong with that, but also social and environmental value. And I think I believe there is a great potential in that. Uh, entrepreneurship is crucial for sustainable development. Uh, it drives innovation. It offers uh, solutions to global challenges. Uh, entrepreneurs can develop uh, sustainable technologies, uh, create uh, green jobs, design uh, products and services, reducing the environmental impact, improving the, these, uh, uh, the, social, uh, uh, the social situation for people. Um, so that's what I would like to emphasize uh, uh, in this uh, presentation. And just to give uh, an inspiring example uh, from uh, Sweden, uh, Slovatan, uh, it's a simple uh, portable device which uses sunlight to purify water for drinking. Um, so uh, 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 Slovatan developed a portable uh, water purifier and it uses solar energy. And this innovation has provided clean drinking water to thousands of households in developing countries, uh, reducing uh, waterborne diseases, but also improving the quality of life while also being environmentally uh, friendly. And uh, with this example, I also wanted to, to bring uh, the importance of system thinking. Uh, this means considering the entire life cycle of of a product or a service and understanding its broader impact on the environment and society. Uh, and by doing so, entrepreneurs can make more informed uh, decisions that contribute uh, uh, truly to sustainable uh, development. Uh, just to use the, the same example to, to exemplify uh, system thinking and what I'm trying to say here. Like if this water pur purifier was using, let's say significant amount of fossil fuel energy, then it might be contributing uh, positively to SDG uh, 6, clean water. 
but negatively to SDG, uh, SDG 3, the 13th, sorry, climate action. Um, so I'm um, like this with very, uh, a very simple example. I just want to, to highlight and emphasize the importance to, to recognize that sometimes through entrepreneurship, while addressing one problem, we, might, we may unconsciously create another problem. Uh, and then there is uh, like a very famous example, a very uh, like everyone is speaking about electric cars nowadays and its potential to reduce greenhouse uh, gas emissions because, you know, it's a more efficient uh, use of energy. Um, but also there is uh, another aspect of it, the extractions of materials for their uh, batteries, uh, lithium and uh, cobalt. Uh, their extraction can lead to environmental degradation uh, through habitat uh, destruction, the pollution of air, uh, the pollution of water, uh, but also it has some negative social impacts, uh, including human rights violations. Uh, for example, child labor, uh, displacements of indigenous uh, communities, uh, in addition to the health risks uh, to the nearby population because of the pollution. Um, so uh, th this takes me to, to the ne uh, next slide uh, and to the importance of uh, fostering uh, skills uh, uh, such as system thinking, uh, system thinking, uh, problem solving, creativity. And I believe these entrepreneurial skills should be fostered in all students, regardless, regardless of their field of study. I think these skills are very useful uh, even for uh, students who are not studying business per se. And uh, I think it's very valuable and the variable, uh, these skills are very valuable for addressing the sustainability uh, challenge. Uh, but also I would like to add that generally speaking at schools and university, uh, we put a lot of focus on equipping students with knowledge and skills. Uh, but I believe that it's equally important to also emphasize attitudes that are crucial for sustainable development. Optimism, which I'm hoping to bring uh, uh, through this presentation, um, simply defined as believing in the posi uh, possibility of positive outcomes and the potential to make a difference. Uh, perseverance, uh, perseverance, I mean, I should not use uh, this word because I cannot even <laughs> pronounce it, uh, but uh, the importance of continuing to strive towards goals despite challenges and setbacks. I think it's important to embrace failures. It might take more than one attempt to, to be successful, uh, but also adaptability, uh, an attitude of uh, flexibility, being flexible and willing to change approaches when faced with new information, with new circumstances, with, 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 with the new data. So I think it's equally important to foster these entrepreneurial attitudes to tackle the sustainability challenge. And again, these should be uh, fostered in all students despite uh, their fields. Uh, and I think these attitudes and skills are essential uh, for uh, addressing the sustainability challenge, uh, enabling individuals uh, to envision and work towards a better future. Um, and Perhaps it's time to end my presentation now, and I would like to end it with uh, this inspiring, is inspiring quote uh, from Madame uh, C.J. Walker, who says, don't sit down and wait for the opportunities to come. Get up and make them. Um, Madame C.J. Walker uh, was an entrepreneur and also a political and social activist. Uh, she was... Uh, the first female self-made millionaire in America. And that was in the early 1900s. Uh, so during a time when opportunities were severely limited for women and African-Americans. Uh, and uh, she left a remarkable legacy of social responsibility through empowering women, uh, providing employment, uh, providing training opportunities to marginalized groups, uh, in addition to speaking out against uh, racial uh, violence, she used their, uh, her uh, influence to, to push for reforms. And uh, maybe I can recommend uh, this Netflix uh, series, Self Made, uh, that is inspired by her story. And I think it's very inspiring. Not that I'm promoting Netflix or anything, but uh, I think uh, her story is, is very inspiring and uh, I strongly uh, recommend it. 
Uh, and with that, I would like to thank you all for uh, listening. And uh, please feel free to add me on LinkedIn if you would like to uh, further discuss uh, uh, these topics. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amar, for sharing um, your experience, your research, and also you know with good examples from Chalmers and from Sweden. I believe that you know, especially Azerbaijan, where the conference is being held, has a lot to learn from the examples of Sweden in terms of innovation and entrepreneurship for sustainable development. Thank you very much. And now we're Thank going you. to move. Go ahead, please. Anmar, you wanted to say something? No, uh, I just to say thank you. Thank you too. Um, so now we're going to move on to um, Professor Leonie Baldacchino. She is joining us from the University of Malta, Malta. And I personally read her articles a lot because I also research uh, partially uh, opportunity recognition for sustainable development, uh, entrepreneurial opportunity recognition. So Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you, good evening everyone and thank you very much uh, to uh, Mahmoud and also the organizing team for inviting me to present at uh, this conference. I am trying to share my screen. Okay, so here we are. All right, so as um, you can see on my slide, the focus of my presentation is on um, opportunity identification or opportunity recognition in, uh, uh, with respect to sustainable and circular entrepreneurship. So I really enjoyed uh, listening to the previous pre uh, presentation by Anwar, who, who really and truly set the stage in a way for, for everything that I will be saying now. In fact, I will be skimming through a couple of the slides because he uh, he's already done the groundwork for me, so thank you for that. Right, so um, in his presentation, Anwar asked you to Google the definition of entrepreneurship. And in, um, in, in most definitions, uh, at least in the popular literature, one would find entrepreneurship as referring to uh, business ownership, uh, starting up a business or acquiring uh, ownership of a business through different ways, including through um, inheritance, so inheriting a family business or even purchasing a business. Um, but there is actually a lot more to entrepreneurship than that. One can be an entrepreneur even within an existing organization, so one can be what we call an intrapreneur. So to me, really and truly, what distinguishes entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs is more the way the individual behaves within the context of business and whether or not he or she is necessarily um, owning the business as such. And one of the key defining features of entrepreneurship is opportunity identification and the rest of the process that comes after it. So identification, opportunity identification, uh, evaluation and eventually um, exploitation. And in fact, if we look at uh, many academic definitions in, uh, in journal articles and so on, and, and in textbooks, one would find a lot of reference to opportunities. And so there are there are authors who would actually say that uh, one is not uh, an entrepreneur before they have identified and exploited opportunities and whatnot. So the focus of my presentation is uh, on, okay, so how can entrepreneurs in general, but more specifically sustainable and secular entrepreneurs um, identify opportunities? Now, Talking about mainstream entrepreneurship, I think uh, historically and traditionally, entrepreneurs have had uh, quite a, a bad reputation, right? So traditionally, they haven't really been uh, the, the sort of people, you know, businesses, big business industry hasn't really been associated with uh, environmental, um, uh, the, the doing good to the environment. On, on, on the other hand, you know, they're more associated with environmental degradation and pollution and sometimes even uh, social and unethical issues, unfortunately. However, um, it has been increasingly evident in, in the past years that uh, entrepreneurs are increasingly uh, concerned with environmental and also social uh, issues. And I, I also appreciate what Anmar was saying about the fact that sometimes um, entrepreneurs are uh, doing their best in order to address a particular social or environmental cause. 
but it may inadvertently uh, cause some collateral damage in another way. So maybe we can pick this up uh, later on. But in general, looking at uh, entrepreneurship, we have seen, thankfully, uh, a trend, a growing trend towards uh, doing good, right? So there has been the emergence of concepts like social entrepreneurship, which is um, entrepreneurship aimed at a particular social cause, so improving society in some way. Eco-entrepreneurship or green entrepreneurship or environmental entrepreneurship, they mean more or less the same thing, uh, which is doing business in order to um, attain some sort of environmental, uh, doing environmental good. And also um, sustainable entrepreneurship, which is uh, essentially a, a, a form of entrepreneurship that is viewed as encompassing all the three P's, so to speak. So the P for profit, which is the financial dimension and the traditional uh, form of entrepreneurship, people, which is the social dimension, and planet, which is the environmental dimension. Uh, one of the oldest definitions of sustainable entrepreneurship that I have come across is well, doing entrepreneurship in a sustainable way or combining entrepreneurship on the one hand and um, sustainable development and sustainability on the other, right? So I don't need to define what sustainability and sustainable development is uh, in the context of this conference because I know I will be preaching to the converted. But it's interesting to, to see how um, the, 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 the concept of entrepreneurship has evolved to encompass also, you know, not just looking at businesses as harming the environment or harming society, but actually business for good, entrepreneurship for good. Uh, an even more recent concept, because sustainable entrepreneurship in itself is nowadays not so uh, recent anymore, there has been a lot of work on sustainable entrepreneurship, but more recently the concept of circular entrepreneurship has evolved. Um, and this there isn't much literature, academic literature, on this as yet, but the definition that uh, we have adopted tends to be, so, uh, doing entrepreneurship or engaging in entrepreneurial activity that is aligned with circular economy principles. Okay, so this, of course, involves opportunity identification, evaluation and exploitation, as entrepreneurship generally does, but rather than doing it within the framework of the linear, the traditional linear economy, which assumes that one can take resources from the earth, use them in order to make, produce. Okay, so you take, you make, you use, and then you dispose. That is the traditional linear model. That was then uh, revised for more sustainable uh, businesses where uh, the, the notion of recycling and reusing was, was introduced, but still within a pretty linear model. Whereas with circular economy, one tries to eliminate uh, waste and uh, trying to, to make best use of resources by design right from the start. So maintaining resources uh, within the economy in a circular fashion. Okay, So rather than make, uh, take, make waste or take, make, use and dispose, there is more of a, a reuse, repair cycle before eventually then when it reaches the end of its life, uh, life at uh, the end of its life, it is then recycled and re, uh, somehow reused once again. So, taking a look now, I uh, wanted to share some very briefly some uh, research insights with you. My uh, a lot of my research has focused on opportunity identification in in general, and there is a lot of, uh, as I said before, research on, uh, on opportunity identification in mainstream literature and the traditional entrepreneurship. So, we're together with uh, some uh, past students, then there were students of mine reading for the Master in Creativity and Innovation at the Edward de Bono Institute. Uh, we started to look at opportunity identification in relation to sustainable entrepreneurship and later then also in relation to circular um, entrepreneurship. So, what is it over and above what entrepreneurs do in general to identify uh, opportunities? Uh, what is it over and above that? sustainable entrepreneurs and circular entrepreneurs need to do or what can enable them to identify opportunities in their respective fields. And as a starting point, we took um, a conceptual model that was proposed in the literature by Katzel and Shepard in 2011. And this conceptual model basically argues that uh, sustainable opportunities are recognized 
when individuals have prior knowledge of the natural and communal environment. So if you know about issues in the national, natural environment and in your communal environment, you are more likely to identify an opportunity, a sustainable opportunity to address that. It is also influenced by motivation, and motivation here in this model is uh, uh, split into perception of threat of the natural and communal environment, but also being motivated to, um, to do good, basically altruism towards others. And all of this is moderated by broader general entrepreneurial knowledge. So in uh, the first paper that was uh, carried out by um, Ruven Hanahoff under my supervision and co-authored with me, we looked at that model in an empirical setting and we carried out some structured interviews with uh, eight sustainable entrepreneurs in Berlin. And as a result of uh, our thematic analysis, we were able to elaborate on the conceptual model to identify, for example, um, what prior knowledge uh, could be sourced from, where it could come from. So in this case, we saw that uh, participants who had spent time abroad, participants who spent more time socializing in particular relevant areas, they were uh, able to acquire prior knowledge of the um, natural and communal environment that then enabled them to identify opportunities. Um, similarly, having relevant prior jobs and relevant prior projects which related to sustainability was also uh, a relevant source of uh, entrepreneurial knowledge. In uh, the second paper, which was carried out uh, as part of uh, Steve Diakono's studies, we here elaborated on Patzelt and Shepard's model to integrate a concept specifically from circular from the circular economy. So we figured that if prior knowledge of the natural and communal environment would help towards sustainable um, opportunity identification, knowing specifically about the circular economy and its principles is likely to help um, individuals identify circular entrepreneurs, not just, uh, sorry, opportunities, not only sustainable ones. So for example, if a marine biologist knows about sustainability, then he or she would be likely to identify a sustainable uh, opportunity. But if that uh, marine biologist knows specifically about the principles of the circular economy and, uh, and, and other related um, information, then he or she would be more likely to identify an opportunity that is circular and not only sustainable. In this model, we also integrated um, the Regenerate uh, framework, which was proposed by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, a leading think tank in uh, the field of circular economy. And this is basically uh, six levers or six actions that uh, businesses can take towards uh, shifting towards a circular economy. So the R represents regenerate, as you can see in, uh, in the model here, and share, uh, optimize, loop, virtualize, and exchange. And these were, in fact, uh, confirmed to be uh, relevant for the secular entrepreneurs that uh, participated in this study. And here we had a total of nine entrepreneurs, three from Malta, three from Ireland, and three from the Netherlands, chosen in order to have a balance of um, well, uh, the performance on the resource efficiency scoreboard, that is how we, we selected the three countries. So a few reflections before I conclude. Uh, it does seem that just as it is in mainstream entrepreneurship and so sustainable and secular entrepreneurship, knowledge is power. So knowing about what is going on around oneself, knowing about the issues in the community, issues related to circular economy and so on, and also having relevant entrepreneurial knowledge um, is important for opportunity identification. In class, I like to speak about uh, not how every problem is an opportunity in disguise, and this was also Anwar's starting point, if I recall correctly, and how important it is to do things with passion. But sometimes students struggle with how do I identify an a problem, you know, let alone turn it into a into an opportunity or how, how do I identify which of my passions could be the source of a business idea. And here are a few suggestions are to actually just refer to the sustainable development goals because these would be really excellent um, tools for aspiring and established entrepreneurs 
who wish to operate in a sustainable manner. So an aspiring entrepreneur who is still looking around for a problem to solve um, could look at the SDGs as a source of uh, business problem, uh, a problems that their business ideas could then be targeted to, to solve. And also we mentioned the Resolve Framework here to um, knowledge of this Resolve Framework could enable um, both aspiring and established entrepreneurs to shift towards um, a circular economy model. And again, because knowledge is power, I just would like to mention very briefly the courses that we offer here at the Edward the Bono Institute, just in case anybody is uh, offered in following up. We offer PhD programs, um, a Master in Creativity and Innovation, which also integrates entrepreneurship and a part-time evening diploma. And on that note, I would like to conclude by asking a question that Anwar started with. Why bother? Because really and truly, I do believe that doing well and doing good is what it means to be doing great. So I thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to questions and discussions later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Leonie Baldacchino. I'm um, also really grateful to you for you know sharing your research outcomes with us. I believe that your research really paved the really big path for researchers like me and motivated excellent up upcoming research on opportunity recognition because before you we didn't have a qualitative uh, you know analysis of the model by Shepard and Paltzelt and once again thank you and we are moving on uh, with Professor um, Jared Ezeguiano from Connors University of Technology Lithuania. The floor is yours dear Professor. Hello everyone Thank you very much, Mahmoud, for inviting me here. And thank you very much, previous speakers, for focusing on opportunities more than the problems, because recently this world sustainability is a buzzword and uh, people and uh, companies, they are more focusing on threats and uh, risks, but forgetting that uh, a sustainable business, sustainable business development might be an opportunity too with regards to different new business models and even uh, sustainability vendors, business models, a lot of that. Well, myself, I am professor of finance originally. For many years, I was teaching and research in corporate finance. But alongside with Lithuania, which uh, developed very quickly as the fintech hub. I was involved in this development as well and turned my uh, attention to fintech uh, while doing some project with business in, involving artificial intelligence for credit fairness estimation. And uh, then I found find out that sustainability is really very much related not only to finance, but also to fintech and artificial intelligence solutions. Uh, therefore, I would like to share a couple of examples on how artificial intelligence might be applied uh, for uh, sustainable finance solutions. Well, recently uh, I am focusing on sustainable finance, uh, teaching at Konas University of Technology in Lithuania. As, as well as, as this business school in France, Lyon. Uh, I'm also consulting businesses on sustainability tra transformation. And um, I am board member at the Lithuanian Responsible Business Association. So all my life I was a bit in academia and business. So my activity is focused more on applied research or business oriented solutions. Uh, therefore, I would like to bring your attention to a couple of, of um, uh, to several potential AI applications uh, with regard to sustainability issues. One application is uh, came out uh, from one business um, research project, and also we published several papers on that topic about how uh, artificial intelligence can be incorporated in credit worthiness estimation of uh, specific to SMEs. 
Uh, and this uh, potential application can be referred to as access to finance for SMEs and financial inclusion, because financial inclusion also refers to one of uh, United uh, Nations SDG goals. And of course, the importance uh, of access to finance is a significant problem for business development and is considered uh, one of the measures representing the level of financial inclusion, meaning that access to finance means also financial inclusion. And developing financial innovation, fintech solutions such as crowdfunding, mobile payments, AI-based credit scoring systems has a huge potential uh, to increase financial inclusion, not only for individuals, but also for businesses, especially for uh, SMEs, uh, enabling the unscored or unbanked population to become active members of financial markets. Uh, as uh, all of us, we know that uh, small and medium enterprises are major drivers of each country's economy. Uh, it is, of course, important that they have uh, access to credit financing. Uh, but uh, this is not always the case. Uh, and unfortunately, this is sometimes not possible because it's difficult for financial institutions to evaluate the credit worthiness of SMEs, maybe due to the lack of data or, or short life cycle of the company. There might be many reasons. And the data indicates that the share of so-called uh, credit invisible SMEs in Europe changed uh, in the range of from 10 to 30 percent, uh, meaning up to one third of SMEs uh, might be uh, financial invisible, meaning they can't not uh, uh, get a bank loan and access it and have access to finance. So here AI might uh, be a, a solution. Uh, of course, to develop the solutions, we still need uh, more and more research and application. But uh, uh, wide opportunities uh, for artificial intelligence uh, are seen in tasks associated uh, with uh, credit scoring particularly. And for example, European Banking Federation anticipates uh, that the use of uh, artificial intelligence technology enables more accurate scoring and allows for improved access to credit by reducing the risks. Uh, the finan financial risk assessment of SMEs uh, could be covered uh, by artificial intelligence models incorporating both conventional financial models, which we know for decades, uh, but we also now can include uh, unstructured non-financial data uh, processed by deep learning techniques and methods as artificial intelligence is really good in text recognition. So combining both financial modeling, financial data, traditional financial analysis, and non-financial data powered by and generated by artificial intelligence, we can have more accurate risk assessment of models and credit for estimation of small and medium enterprises. There are even uh, startups and companies that try to evaluate financial risks using solely non-financial data uh, by empowering artificial intelligence. And then uh, it's possible to compare the data uh, that uh, are extracted from using uh, traditional financial data and non-financial data generated by artificial intelligence. Uh, thus, uh, credit scores that are calculated by incorporating AI are expected to improve financial institutions, banks, for example, abilities 
to score those so-called credit invisible SMEs, uh, which is likely to expand financial inclusion. It means, in turn, that better credit scoring and estimation of credit worthiness could improve SMEs' access to finance, which uh, brings us to uh, one of uh, sustainable goals to improve access to finance. So that is one example, uh, and this is a summary of some of my practical applications and some research as well. The other uh, example of um, adopting artificial intelligence solutions uh, in sustainability and potential uh, in the field of sustainability uh, I would say can be ESG data, ESG data management and analysis for sustainable investments. Uh, because of course, since I'm from, from finance, from sustainable finance field, uh, now we talk a lot about sustainable investments, ESG investments, green investments, impact investments that are not the same terms in fact, interrelated, but not the same. But looking from investor's perspective, uh, there is a problem how to assess uh, the ESG data of investees. So uh, data is a key factor for sustainability uh, assessment and evaluation. Without data, it's impossible to assess the achievement of sustainability objectives by investee and data is a must. But as you can imagine, we have very fragmented data so far on uh, sustainability or E and S and G factors. Uh, so uh, companies just as they capture financial data, uh, they will need to put system in place to capture sustainability data. This will come with uh, European regulation on, on uh, sustainability uh, data provision. Uh, we have uh, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive and European Sustainability Reporting Standards. So uh, those companies uh, uh, who fell under this directive, they will provide the data. But still, there are many companies uh, unscored. Uh, and for investors, it's very important to get access to data for investment evaluation. So in the coming decades, the vast majority, vast amount of data is expected to be a major factor in fostering sustainable wealth uh, through various means. And with the increasing availability of environmental, social and governance data, then investors can make more informed decisions to align with their sustainability goals or sustainability goals with their capital providers. So here, artificial intelligence might play a significant role in collecting, structuring, and analyzing sustainability data. In fact, there are, uh, there is uh, 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 FinTech Global the company has launched ESG FinTech 100 list uh, to shine a spotlight on the world's most innovative technology solution fitting global challenges. So FinTech is not only about financial technologies, but recently we can see this trend financial technologies for sustainability. And this list of uh, has named uh, 100 companies uh, that are transforming the fight ag against uh, climate risk, sustainability, social responsibility, uh, and governance challenges. And uh, I would like to bring a couple of examples uh, from that list about fintech startups, how they incorporate artificial intelligence solution for sustainability assessment and investment. So one of those companies is called Aukwan. 
uh, and this company leveraged AI to turn the world's unstructured data to actionable risk and ESG intelli intelligence for financial services customers. This is one example. The second example is um, uh, uh, one company of this ESG FinTech 100 list is called Upright. And this startup is uh, building a new type of science-based quantification model for impact measurement that can be used for assessing impact investment. Because in contrast to, uh, for example, green investments, impact investments needs not only to generate financial risk, but also to assess impact of that particular investment. And assessing Im the impact is really quite a complicated task. Uh, but uh, the impact investment can be called the term impact investment only when investee is providing particular data for impact measurement. And here, some artificial intelligence solution can be used for uh, impact measurement. Uh, another example, uh, Intellect AI, company called Intellect AI, uh, offers uh, ESG insights with AI precision, uh, customizable ratings, so you can customize your rating according your interest, either in E, S, or G part of your investment, and uh, they collect real-time data for informed, uh, proactive investment decisions. And of course, many more examples uh, on this list. Uh, I really highly recommend to check it out. Uh, and I, of course, I brought up only a couple of, um, of uh, examples of how artificial intelligence can be applied for sustainability solutions. Uh, those, uh, of course, from the perspective of sustainable finance. And uh, with that, I would like to stop here and uh, thank you for your attention. That's all from my side. Thank you very much, dear Professor Gerda Zigiene. Um, I really appreciate um, your great speech that you talked about the applications, potential applications of AI in sustainable development. I believe that, well, although research is just gaining you know, ground in this field, I believe that we, we still have a lot of scarcity, that we need more research to be done, yet to be done in this field. Um, so uh, we don't have any questions from the audience, but like, uh, you speakers, feel free to ask questions or just like if you want to make additional comments, the floor is yours. Um, maybe I have questions, if I may. One uh, one for Leonie and one for uh, Gerda or Gerda. Excuse my pronunciation. Is 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 it Gerda or Gerda? It's Gerda. Gerda. But it's okay. okay. <laughs> That's a common okay. question. Gerda, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, so my question to you, Gerda, is about assessing and measuring uh, the impact, the sustainable impact. Uh, and I agree with you, Mahmoud, there, uh, there is really lack of research, and I think we are still struggling with that. There are attempts, a lot of attempts, and it's nice to see the artificial intelligence playing a, a role in, you know, with the data. But but also, like, uh, it just, just takes me to the question is, like, uh, is it uh, is it also realistic to to measure the sustainability impact? Is it possible? Um, I know that is very important. We need. Uh, I'm like, how do we know we are successful or we are in making an impactful uh, question? Uh, imp sorry, impactful uh, contribution. Uh, without you know measuring right, without uh, seeing the the outcome. Uh, but also like this uh, desire to quantify everything. Maybe not everything is possible to quantify per se. So I, I see a dilemma here, I, and uh, I don't think I have a solution. As like, but what are your reflections on that about the things that uh, we cannot quantify? 
well, I'm from finance. So yeah. <laughs> here we like is, numbers. Yes. Exactly. So we need to quantify it as much as possible for making uh, uh, investment in, uh, investment decision made uh, relying on particular information. Of course, since uh, we have these developments of AI uh, for non-financial data, and non-financial data refers to, for example, press release uh, or information in social media chats and so on. So yes, those financial uh, estimations are um, supplemented by non-financial information. But here I think we talk about, uh, we put two different topics in one. So if yeah. we talk about uh, sustainability estimation and impact investment. So uh, let me maybe just quickly refer to terms. So if we talk about sustainability related investment, so uh, investor need to estimate uh, that company is um, uh, acting in a sustainable in a sustainable way. For that, we have like four, five, six strategies on estimation starting from negative screening. So, um, so uh, we don't need to we don't uh, want to see in our portfolio companies that, for example, human rights violation and uh, so on. So there are strategies and methods how to estimate uh, uh, sustainability investments. But talking mm -hmm. about impact investment, we still have very uh, small uh, share of impact investment in all sustainability investments. Uh, this is a must to evaluate impact and to measure mm. impact. Otherwise, we cannot call this impact investment at all. If we yeah. talk about green investment, for example, we all also need to estimate uh, the environmental impact of this particular in investment. So here, uh, for example, green bonds, if we, if we issue green bonds, so all the proceeds from green bonds issuance must be used for environmental project. So we have rules in finance <laughs> and we want yeah. to quantify, yes. Even yeah, though I, I, not yeah. everything can be quantified, I agree. Yeah, I, I was a banker myself for five years before okay, getting into so academia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, may I, uh, thank you very much. That was a very good answer uh, and very good reflections. Uh, can I uh, take the next second question? To you, yes, uh, Leonie. Please. Okay, uh, so my question to Leonie, um, you spoke about SDGs as uh, as a framework, and I myself uh, put SDGs in my uh, presentations as a very common uh, source of inspiration. Uh, but also, like uh, SDGs are like developed by the UN, by it is goals for countries, right? Um, uh, and also, they are designed as goals. So the question is like. What happens of the, uh, if the goals are, uh, you know, reached? Uh, so they are not really uh, uh, shaped as principles, for example. Uh, uh, so this can be problematic. On the other hand, they have the advantage of being uh, very popular. It's agreed upon worldwide, despite the fact that they are not exactly, um, you know, based on scientific research. Uh, and there are some overlaps between them. Um, so yeah, I wonder about your your reflections on that. I mean, like, is it is it always the best source for inspiration, or uh, what other frameworks can businesses uh, seek opportunities from? Okay, thank you for that question. Um, with regards to your comment that uh, what will happen when the the goals are all met, that would be a great problem to have. <laughs> I. I can, I can't see, at least in my lifetime, that all of these goals will truly, uh, truly ever be met. Um, and yes, it's true, they are broad, they are, they are goals, but ultimately, what I meant by uh, they can be a source of inspiration, I, the way I use them with my students is after I've done um, the traditional opportunity identification workshops, which include 
coming up with a list of problems and then using the creative thinking uh, techniques to identify uh, business ideas that uh, could solve some of those problems and then also looking at their uh, their passions or they're interested in. Sometimes they really struggle. So then having something concrete like the SDGs and looking at, I don't know, randomly, um, life below water. You know, there could be a student who that particular one really resonates with, with, with a particular student or with a particular team because they happen to be um, into uh, swimmers or into scuba diving or, you know, I, I, I come from Malta and we're, uh, <laughs> we're, we're surrounded by the sea. So that, that in itself can be a great stepping stone um, for idea generation and idea development. Is it the best framework? I don't, I, I don't think that one can answer that question. I don't think there is such a thing as a best framework because different frameworks are, uh, they, they all have their strengths and they will have their shortcomings, right? No. And they are all appropriate in different ways, which is why I also referred to the Resolve framework. Yeah. Which is the Ellen McCarter Foundation. And I didn't have too much time and I didn't want to use more than my 15 minutes to uh, spend spend going through the Resolve framework properly on, on my slide. But if you if you look it up, it is easily accessible online. And some of the examples that are given as an illustration of how the resolve could be used towards uh, circularity um, are quite enlightening in themselves. And again, they could, you know, trigger ideas of, oh, OK, I've never thought of it that way. Um, so, yeah, my two cents worth. I don't know if I've answered your question. Yes, you did, and and uh, and also like uh, just to, to be clear that I'm not saying that it is wrong to use the SDGs for ins inspirations. I use them uh, as well for students, and I think they are very powerful. But you know, the academic inside me, I like to to take the other side of the argument also. Um, and I, I agree with you. I think uh, all these tools and frameworks that we have, I think uh, they supplement each other, and I don't think one of them. Uh, is just replaces the need for others. Uh, yeah, but sure. that was and a... Earlier, Anwar, if I may, you also mentioned the importance of uh, creativity, for example, as, yeah. as a skill. I agree with you 100% over there that that is really and truly the foundation, you know, at the heart of it. Because yep. as we, we teach our students how to think creatively. And initially, they kind of think, well, doesn't everyone know how to think? Isn't everyone, you know, or aren't you born creative and or, or, or not? Um, whereas creative thinking is a skill. And just like any other skill, it can be trained, it can be nurtured. There are methods Absolutely. That, are, that can be used. And again, you know, those frameworks and those techniques also fit quite nicely into, in, in, into this whole uh, overarching theme. Yes. Thank you very much, Amar, for the questions and the dear fellow speakers for answering the questions. Um, do you have more questions? Um, maybe Professor Leone and uh, Professor Gare, do you have any questions from your side? I have just a quick uh, remark on SDGs. So mm -hmm. let us think that it was 2015 when United Nations decided uh, to give us some at least for global framework, because before we didn't have this global framework. So it brought us from chaos on what sustainability is to some system that can be used globally. And also we have 169 sub goals there. So mm -hmm. companies can refer. And uh, uh, of course, here in Europe, it is uh, uh, regulation now we have specifically E, S, and G part, and it might seem that SDGs are not relevant anymore, but many companies export or import. So if we, they want uh, to, to uh, uh, release their information on sustainability issues, they uh, use, uh, still they use SDGs because this is worldwide uh, framework. And if I may, perhaps a final remark uh, with regards yes, to please. Anwar was um, speaking about in his presentation about the importance of systems thinking. I think um, he made a really important point there that is very often overlooked. 
And because, you know, we're so focused on trying to come up with the idea, the business idea, the business opportunity to solve the problem that uh, in, in many cases, you know, we lose, we lose sight of the big picture and yeah. like mentioned before, unintended yeah. uh, negative consequences. So um, I, I, I will definitely bear that in mind also uh, in, in, in my research and in my teaching. Thank you. And thanks also to um, Gerda for the insights on AI. Interesting to look at things from that perspective. Yeah, and I take this opportunity also to to thank you, uh, Leonie. Um, great inspirations. I'm gonna look into your research. That's very relevant uh, to what I'm doing. Uh, Professor Gerda, also thank you very much. Uh, very valuable insights. Uh, and Mahmoud, thank you for inviting me and for facilitating this session. Indeed, thank you. Well, now it's thank my you very much. Turn. All. I'm thank also you all. To all. Thank, <laughs> you. thank you. It was really much. valuable and insightful. Well, it's nice meeting you all, at least online. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is a great step to start maybe for the collaboration. Yes, why not? Hopefully. Hopefully. Great. And have an amazing weekend to you all. Um, not sure how is the weather in Sweden, but I'm sure that in, uh, in, in Malta it's going to be good. So anyways, have a great weekend. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.